Welcome back to our continued study through the book of Revelation. Uh, got started on chapter 19. It's been a couple weeks. I uh, didn't make a video last week. Uh, had uh, uh, discussion broke out at Bible study at church on a Wednesday night. And uh, when that happens, I just let it flow because um, I really like interaction. I really like Bible study. I really like hearing people's comments. And I love it when people ask questions. and. Um, got into a pretty good discussion. Had another one again last night. Made a little bit of headway. Um, didn't cover a whole lot of scripture uh, last night, but uh, I don't want to go over two weeks and not make a, uh, not put a video online. And um, we did make a little headway last night. Just not, not as much as normal. But there is a lot of information in this. You know, chapter, Revelation chapter 19 has got a lot. Of, it covers a lot of ground. Um, it does have a lot of information. It's a lot of great. It's exciting. It's an exciting chapter because it's when we all come back. It's when I mean we, I saw heaven opened in verse 11. Uh, you know we all we're all we've been there. We went through the marriage supper of the Lamb. Seven-year tribulation period is over with. Um, the wrath of God has come to an end, and the wrath of the Lamb is about to come to the earth and uh, destruction and melting and fever and heat and 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 it's all fixing to all fixing to happen it's all fixing to come so it's an exciting chapter there's a lot in here to talk about a lot in here to go over a lot in here to discuss and uh, it would be fantastic if we could have open discussion with this online you know that's why i keep I always encourage people to make comments to ask questions you know to join in you know be a part and uh, put your comments on there it, it's uh, it's exciting it's an exciting book it's exciting times it's one of the things we were talking about at church last night these are exciting times that we're living in right now they're very a lot of things are happening prophetically um, a lot of things are happening I was talking with somebody last night after church uh, Texting on the phone, something that I grew up never imagined. What's another one of those things that I never imagined? I remember when, when I was in school, when I was in elementary school, they had uh, they had they brought these things into our classroom one day, and it was it was two big giant suitcases. And when I say big, I mean I was a I was in probably the fourth grade, maybe the fifth grade. So I'm sure they weren't as big as in my mind I remember them being, but they were huge, and they were they, there was one on one at each end of the classroom. And when they opened them all up and connected them together with a cord, it was two telephones. And they actually, in school, they actually taught us telephone etiquette. They taught us the proper way to use a telephone. How to, how to I mean, they went through the whole motions, how to look, how to look up somebody's name in the phone book. We, we actually had to do that. How to dial the phone the proper number of times to let the phone ring before you hung up and, and, and you decided no one was home and, and all of those things. And then we had to all learn how to answer the telephone, how to properly speak into the telephone. It was, I remember that vividly, it, 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 it's weird. And now um, I was sitting here not too long ago, I was sitting here and somebody on the other side of the world called me on my phone and when I answered, they were, it was a video. It was a FaceTime call through uh, through the internet. It's just it's amazing. It, it, it's it, it's amazing what's going on around us. But it's all and, and it's happening at a frantic pace. But the thing about it is, <coughs> what it is is we're on that we we pat we, we're over that crest of the hill, and we've started down the hill. And 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 prophetically and biblically, you can argue what. You know, you can debate among yourselves what the crest of that hill was when, when we started down the slope. The, the, but it's it's moving at a fast pace. The Bible describes it as as a woman's labor pains. They get faster and they come faster and faster and faster. And the faster they come, the worse they get. And that's that's what we're in. Those are the times. And when I say exciting. I don't mean exciting like a great adventure. I mean, there's things going on you can't keep up. I've talked about that before. You, you can't hardly keep up with, with what is going on in the world because so much is happening in so many places all at the same time. <coughs> 
and things are working out. Bible uh, prophecy is being fulfilled. Things are coming about. We're starting to realize, you know, new things. We're thinking about new things. Uh, we were in a discussion last night, and I'll, I'll bring it up later on. And, and we were talking about another aspect of prophetically, you know, how, how things always assume to be a certain way, but now they very well could be a different way. So when I say we're living in exciting times, I mean, it's, it's exciting for me simply because we're just another day closer to Christ coming and taking us away. And, you know, the world makes fun of us because we're trusting in, you know, this big guy in the sky is going to come and save us. And, and they think that's they think that's funny and they think it's stupid and they think that we're, you know, dweebs and hicks and backwards thinkers and, and all that kind of thing. But, you know, I'd rather I'd rather be standing there as a backwards thinker when Jesus snatches me off the ground than to be thinking logically and in my own mind and going by what makes sense to me at the time and being left behind. So, you know, it's like uh, Bob Dylan once said, you got to serve somebody. You got to serve somebody. So you can either be on the right side of history or you can be on the wrong side of history. And depending on what your viewpoint is, makes all the difference to you what the right side and the wrong side of history is. Are you going to believe the Bible? Or are you going to reject the Bible? You can't believe part of the Bible. And you can't say, well, I like this part of the Bible, but I, I don't necessarily hold to, to that other part. Or you can't say that, you know, it, it's, all, it's all kind of cool, but I just, I just don't believe that's exactly the way it is. You either believe it or you don't. It's either your guide in life or it's not. You either believe every single letter of it or you reject every single letter of it and every single idea of it. Because God's the author of this book. And you can't reject any part of it without rejecting all of Him. And that's disastrous. That's disastrous for everybody who falls into that trap. It don't sound right. It don't make sense to me. That's illogical. Science tells us, blah, blah, blah. Whatever you want, whatever you, thing you want to put in there, however you want to look at it and, and discredit it and discount it as nonsense. It don't matter, it don't matter what you use to discredit the Bible. The, the, in the, at the end of the day, you have discredited the Bible and you have placed yourself in a position of rejecting the authority of God's Word. It's just that simple. We talked, and I talked about that one time before. The Bible is black and white. We love those gray areas. We love those areas where, well, here's what the Constitution says, but this lawyer can spend three days in front of a set of judges and he can convince them that I know that's what the Constitution says, but here's what it really meant based on other things and, and whatever, however you work it. There are no gray areas in the Bible. You either is or you ain't. That's all there is to it. There ain't no gray areas. So continuing on with Revelation uh, chapter 19, We'd worked our way through verse 7. Uh, I think it was verse 7 when we last talked. And uh, yeah, we made our way through verse 7. And, and uh, that's where we'll pick up tonight or today, this morning, with uh, verse 8. So let's just read back through up to the point where we were. Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. I know it says Alleluia, but Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments. And we talked about that. We talked about the mind of Christ. We're going to have that mind of Christ one day. We're not going to see the lake of fire and, and think about it from the standpoint of, oh, my family member's down there. Or, oh, old Bill I worked with for all them years. He's down there. We're not going to see it that way. We're going to have that mind that says, that understands completely and totally what exactly it means to say true and righteous are thy judgments. Verse 2, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. And he hath avenged the blood of his servants, 
at her hand. Verse 3, and again they said, Alleluia, that's two. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Whose smoke? The great whore, Babylon, the city, the, the, the uh, religious, the false religious system, and the city, the actual city, the actual geographic location. Remember we read that scripture in the Old Testament. It's going to burn forever and ever. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. Verse 4, and the four and twenty elders and the four beasts, what, that, what are we talking about here? At the throne, in heaven, at the throne of God. The four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying truth alleluia that's the third time and a voice came out of the throne this voice came from inside the throne it came out of the throne saying praise our God all ye his servants and ye that fear him both small and great who is that that's everybody praise him all ye his servants, that's you and me and everybody else, and ye that fear him, that's you and me and everybody else, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, verse 6, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, that's four, that's four, there's four of them in this, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. <clears throat> Let us be glad and rejoice. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him and his wife, I'm sorry, and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. That's where we left off last time, the study of the, the uh, steps through the, Jewish, the, the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony and comparing them to the life of Christ on earth and his ministry and the things that he did and, 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 and we showed how the things that he did and the things that he said and the things that he went about doing things before he left this earth line up with the ancient Jewish wedding customs and how even within all of that it lines up with the Passover and the other festivals, the Jewish festivals. It all comes together. God has meshed all this stuff together. All these different things, all these different things that represent God, that represent His holiness, that represents His truth, that represents His faithfulness, that represents His righteousness, that represents all of those things. All those things come together in the Bible. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you could not, one man could not sit down and make all this stuff up and have it all work out so perfectly. It is an absolute proven historic fact that no, no one man wrote this whole book. There is evidence, there is no argument among the so-called scholars that this person, that, 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 that the people's names that had these books wrote these books. They're different men. They come from different places. They lived in different times and different eras. And they put this book together. There's no way that they could have planned this out and made this up and just and, and pulled it out of nothing and nowhere so many men and agree with so much to where so many things in this Bible that are described that describe all these aspects of our Holy Father. They describe all of these things and they all mesh and they fit and they come together and they're there. It, 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 there's no way that it could be made up. There's no way that it could be impostered in any kind of way. One man can't do that. It, it, it can't, two or three men couldn't do that. There, there's no way that you can discount and discredit the Bible based on what's written in it. Those hallelujahs, there's four of them. Truth and true and righteous are his judgments. That's the first one. Now remember these hallelujahs, remember who's saying these things out loud. Every single creature in the universe. Every single person in the universe are saying these things in unison to, for each, with each other because of the holy and righteous and just works that God has completed. But the, the, there's four of them were called together. There's four of them. For true and righteous are his judgments. Babylon is destroyed and her smoke will rise forever. Praise for our God from all of his servants and all that fear him. For the Lord God omnipotent 
reigneth. The four hallelujahs of Revelation chapter 19. Every creature in the universe is called and instructed to praise and worship the Holy Father for His works and His righteousness and His truth and His faithfulness and all of the attributes that can be laid to Him. Not just love. He is love, but He is so, so much more. He's so much more. So we ended off there with the, with the pride. The marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife hath made herself ready. That's you and me. She hath made herself ready. What does that imply? What does that imply? She made herself ready. What does that imply? That implies responsibility for you and me. That implies that there's things that we have to do. That implies that there are steps that have to be taken by you and I in order to bring this thing to fruition. When a man, when the, when, when, when the bride and the groom, the prospective bride and the groom, left each other and separated and he went back to his father's house, the bride didn't just sit around. I mean, she didn't just go and sit down and wait. She got her, she, she made her dress. She made all the preparations that she needed to do. She had all of that time while he was building them a room, while he was preparing them a place to go. She was preparing herself. She was busy. She was busy preparing herself for when he comes back. She wasn't just sitting there and, and twiddling her thumbs and watching the days go by. She was making herself ready. I've never been a bride. But I'm assuming that there are some brides out there who, ha who watch these videos. I've been associated with several different weddings in my lifetime from start to finish. And, and even with me and my very limited knowledge of all things wedding, I see the process. Even in even in modern days, where you know we're so we're we're so far away from religious symbolism and religious you know icons and 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 going about doing things biblically, but even in today, you can see there's there's TV shows about women being getting ready for their weddings, the preparations that they go through. I mean, you go see a cake person, you go see a photographer person, you go see all those people that are going to be associated. You spend months and months and months planning one day. These women don't sit around. They're not idle. They're not still. They're, they are, they are, they are, their minds are occupied day and night with this, this one day that's coming. The bride, she did not sit around and wait. She had things to do. She had to, she had to make herself ready. That's what it says. The marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. She has went through the motions and made all the preparations necessary to do what is expected of her in the absence of the bridegroom. And she's ready. And she is anxiously anticipating his arrival. She's not just sitting there like a knot on a log waiting for him to show up. You know, where's he at? When's he coming? She's busy. She's busy. So what does that imply? We are to be busy. Well, I hear that scripture quoted all the time. You're supposed to occupy, Jesus said, to occupy till I come. Well, what does that mean? What are we doing? What are you and I doing to prepare ourselves? What is it that, what are you busy doing? What are you busy doing in anticipation of, as part of the bride, the men and the women alike, I'm, a, I'm part of the bride, as strange as that is coming across my teeth, I'm part of the bride of Christ. So I have to ask myself, this says that I have made myself ready. What have I done to make myself ready? What actions have I undertaken to make myself ready to prepare? What is it that I'm doing? What is, when, when Christ Jesus looks on me from where he's at now, what does he see me doing? 
to prepare myself for his coming back. What does he see me being involved with? What is it he that we're doing that shows him that we are actively participating, that we are anxiously anticipating his way, his coming back, that we are doing everything that we can to be prepared and ready when he shows up. What is it that we're doing? What is it that you're doing? Ask him. If you don't know, if you're not sure, the Bible says if any of you lacks wisdom, ask him. He will tell you. He upbraideth not. He don't make fun of anybody. He don't hold nothing back. He don't trick us. He, don't, he, don't, he, don't, he, he, he will let us know. But ask yourself earnestly, what is it that I'm doing that is showing Christ Jesus that I am anxiously awaiting his return? What is it that I'm doing? His bride, his wife, hath made herself ready. Verse 8. And to her, who is her, his wife, you and me, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Based on what? Based on her active participation and her anxious awaiting of the bridegroom. She was prepared and ready. Her lamps were full. Her wicks were trimmed. And she was standing outside the door waiting for the voice and the noise of the bridegroom. But some of us wouldn't. You're going to be the world. You're going to be part of the group that was ready and waiting, or you're going to be part of the group that was that had burned up all their oil and wasted all their time, and spent all their time minioning around with all these unrealistic things. To her was granted, based on her actions. Remember, salvation is not by works. We're going to read that here in just a minute. Justification and salvation is not by works. Sanctification is 100% based on works. She's made herself ready. And because she's made herself ready, verse 8 says, to her, to me and you, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the linen, the fine linen, is the righteousness of saints. The fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Husbands should love their wives the same way Jesus loves his wife, which is me and you. And gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Cleansing. This is a cleansing agent. This word is designed to be offensive. This word is designed to get under your skin. This word is designed to bring conviction and condemnation into your consciousness so that you can correct that behavior. Correcting that behavior is part of what we've been talking about that's known as she has made herself ready. The Holy Ghost will suggest things to you. Your preacher will suggest things to you through the anointing of the Holy Ghost. He will speak to your inward parts. He will speak to your heart. He will speak to your consciousness. But that's all he will do. He is a gentleman. He will not force you to do anything. He will suggest to you, hey, this is something that you do that you need to stop. Or he will say, hey, here's something that you need to start doing that you've rejected and haven't been doing so far. But guess whose job it is to pick it up from there? He hands you the football. It's your job to run with it. That's all part of making yourself ready. We are active participants, not in our salvation, but in our sanctification. Every single day of our lives, we are supposed to be actively participating. We are supposed to be bathing ourselves 
in the water that is the Word of God. We're not supposed to get offended, offended and demand safe spaces where people can't tell us and condemn us and talk bad and ugly to us. We're supposed to hear that offensive voice. We're supposed to hear that condemnation. We're supposed to answer the call of that conviction brought on us by the water of the Word and allow ourselves to be washed. Because without that washing, we are not fit to put on the clean white garments that is the righteousness of God. We have to make ourselves ready. The washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself. Present what to himself? The church, his bride. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, a glorious bride, not having spot or wrinkle. Listen to that. No spots, no wrinkles. No spots, no wrinkles, or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish. Remember, when it was time for her to go to the Father's house, she was her feet was not allowed to touch the ground. She was not supposed to show up at the wedding, at her wedding, at his Father's house, with even the dust of walking from her home to his on her feet. She was supposed to be absolutely clean and pure and spotless and white. And she was supposed to have been in that by her own doing. Let that register with you for a minute. She was required to show up at his father's house for the wedding, clean and pure and white, without spot and without wrinkle, and without even a speck of dust on her feet. And she was supposed to do that based on her willingness to be prepared, to make herself ready, to be anxiously awaiting the return of her bridegroom, her promised bridegroom. The washing of water by the word is the carrying on of a present work with his church, the bride, and looks to the future presentation in glory, as stated in verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. The present work of sanctification of the church must be distinguished from justification and forgiveness. Justification is an act of God by which a believer is declared righteous. No amount of works or effort on the part of the believer, that's you or me, can produce righteousness. No amount of works or efforts on the part of the believer can produce righteousness. In contrast to righteousness though, sanctification is an ongoing, never-ending work of God through the Holy Ghost in the believer by the Holy Ghost through adherence to the Word and the commandments of God. We elevate our spiritual state up to the level of various positions in Christ. The righteousness thus wrought in the life of the believer is pictured here as the fine linen which adorns the wife of the Lamb. Though even this righteousness is a product of the grace of God, it is distinguished as being related to human works. The linen, the fine linen, may in some sense be a part and be considered a part of the reward given at the judgment seat of Christ to those who have served the Lord here seen collectively as the wife of the Lamb. There's no amount of work that you can do to buy your salvation. But once you have received that gift of God, all of your rewards, all of your recognition, all of your crowns, all of the things that come thereafter are 100% based on your works. That's why when James talks about faith and works and Paul talks about faith and works, it appears in the Bible that they're contradicting each other, that one of them is saying one thing and the other one is saying another thing. That's why that's not true. Works cannot get you salvation. 
But once you receive that gift of God, works gets you all your rewards. It gets you all your crowns. And without crowns, you've got nothing to offer Christ Jesus on the day of His glorious coronation when we all cast our crowns at His feet. We've talked about that before. So the sanctification of the church, making, preparing, making yourself clean and white, making yourself ready, getting ready, being part of that anxious, giddy little bride, those anxious, giddy little girls, pardon my uh, way of describing that, but you know, if, if, you're a, if you're a bride listening to this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You go through that period, you, however long it is, whether it's two months or two years, whatever, whatever long, but, but you're, just, you're just giddy with it. You, I mean, I've, I've seen it over and over and over again. We'll see the church, the bride of Christ, the anticipating bride of Christ, men and women alike, we should be the same way. We should be giddy. We should be giddy with the aspect that, you know, that, that we're going to be part of this and he's coming back to get us. We should be giddy and excited. We should be doing every single thing that we can to keep ourselves ready and clean and washed with the Word so that when it's time to put on those robes of righteousness, we will be granted, we will be allowed to put them on. We should be just like that giddy little anticipating bride that we have all known a thousand times over. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the linen of the righteous, the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Blessed are they which are called. Who is that? Without question, the marriage supper of the Lamb speaks to the union of Christ and His bride. That's you and me. Every redeemed individual that died from the day Christ was on the cross up until that last trumpet is going to sound in our future. And the dead in Christ will rise up out of the ground and the living are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Every single one of those who rose to meet Jesus in the air are a part of His bride, His church, His body. Those blessed individuals who are called to be included to attend this event are made up of every single Old Testament saint from Adam all the way up to the thief on the cross the day that Jesus died. The thief on the cross said, Remember me today, this day in paradise. Remember me. Everybody from Adam who died in righteousness all the way up to the thief on the cross are going to be part of this group. They're part of his bride. Remember Jesus said, three days, just like Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days in the belly of the earth. What was he doing? He was preaching Jesus to all those that are in what was known as Abraham's bosom, as paradise at that time. And remember it said he set captivity free. He set the captives free. He went and preached Jesus to all of those and he took them to heaven. He took them there to wait just like the ones who died yesterday are there waiting in a holding pattern. They're there waiting, anticipating, waiting for him to stand up, waiting. They can hear the voice of God. They are blessed in their own right because they're going to actually hear God when He says in, in the words of, I don't know that that's what He's going to say, but there's a great song called Midnight Cry. And when He says, Son, go get my children, they're going to, th those blessed ones are going to hear that. They're anticipating that hour just like we are. They're just anticipating it on the other side of death than we are but they're anticipating nonetheless. Those blessed individuals who are called to be included to attend this event are made up of every Old Testament saint from Adam right up to the thief on the cross who asked Christ for forgiveness that day, as well as all of those who come out of the Great Tribulation period. Remember we talked about those. Remember in chapter 7, the work of the 144,000 says that I saw this vast, unnumberable amount of people. That's a huge amount of people that's going to come out. The, the works 
of the 144,000 and the angels that fly across around the earth, that those works are going to produce people that come out of the Great Tribulation. It's going to be a huge, huge, huge number of people. All of these different groups as they're presented in the book of Revelation as being seen in heaven by John, all of them are described as an unnumberable amount of people. And we're, we're adding all of these groups together. The ones that are raptured off of the earth, the ones, the dead in Christ that rise, and every Old Testament saint that died from, from Adam right on up. Every one of them. That's a lot. It's a lot of people. All those who came out of the Great Tribulation have washed their robes and are made white by the righteousness of God. Blessed are they. Blessed are you because you fought the good fight. Blessed are you because you've put up with the garbage. Blessed are you because you've held your, high, your head above the nonsense. Blessed are you because you have attempted to spread the gospel. Blessed are you because you have helped the poor. Blessed are you because you took care of the people that was left behind. Blessed are you because of all of these things. Blessed are you and me because we are called. Blessed are they which are called. And remember, that's whosoever will. Many are called, but few are chosen. But see, we, we skip over that because we like to talk about the few that are chosen because there's a lot of different attributes that go along with the chosen. So, we, you know, many are called, but few are chosen. That's the way we read that scripture most of the time. But back up a little bit and listen to that. Many are called. Many are called. Who are called? Everyone is called. Everyone. Blessed are those who are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Luke 14 to 23 says, And the Lord Jesus said unto the servant, which is the Holy Ghost, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Christ sent his servant, the Holy Ghost, out and compelled them. That's not, that word does not mean force. Compelled does not mean force. It's not a forceful thing. He's not going to make you do anything. Talked about that before. It is You are well within your rights. If you read the Bible and you apply decent study time to it, and you make your way through it, and you study the things that are in there, and you give it diligence, and in the end you decide that this ain't for me, you are well within your rights. You are absolutely, the destruction is the end of that road, but you are well within your rights as a human being and, and an agent of free choice and free will to reject it. Now, if you just reject it because it's the cool thing to do, if you just reject it and without never reading it, without ever giving it diligence and study, if you just reject it because it just don't make sense or you just whatever, whatever your reason, then you're a fool. Oh, only a fool says in his heart that there is no God. You're a fool if you reject it anyway, but you're even a bigger fool if you reject the Word of God without even giving it without even giving it a chance. Give it a chance to speak to you. This book is alive. It's not my job to be your Holy Ghost. It's His job, and He does a good job of it. He's been at it for a while. He knows the ins and outs of it. He's been doing this for a while now. It's His job. It ain't mine. It ain't anybody else's. But if you just reject it because it's the, the thing to do, then you're a fool. You're an absolute fool. Blessed are they which are called <clears throat> unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Verse 10 is a very interesting verse. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Now remember, he's not, this is not Christ he's talking to here. This is not Jesus he's talking. This is an angel. This is one of the seven angels. I fell at his feet to worship him. And this is not, no, you know, this is John writing this down. This is the Apostle John. This is not some Johnny come lately that's, you know, that's not acquainted with the way religious things work and the way religious structure works and the way worship works. He's well versed and well acquainted with how things are supposed to work. 
when John says, I fell at his feet to worship him. Worship who? The angel. But he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I don't have any problem whatsoever understanding why John was so overwhelmed that he wanted to fall at this angel's feet. I, I completely get that. I understand that. No, no human in this flesh, in the flesh that we live in, there is no way that we can be a part of and see these things, to experience these things visually, to experience these things in this flesh, to be in the presence of all this holiness and it not affect us. It's going to affect us. I promise you, it's going to affect us. He told him, he said, don't worship me. I am of thy brethren. Both of these scriptures, this happens twice. Not once. Like, like, like I said, this is John. And John's well aware of who this person is that's talking to him. It's an angel. He's well aware of that. He's well aware of that. But this happens twice. Two separate times. Here, what we just read in Revelation 19, verse 10. Also in Revelation 22, verse 8 and 9 says this. And I, John... I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets. Listen to what he added. He added one to it that time. He said, I'm of thy brethren the prophets. And of them which keep the sayings of this book. What does that mean? He's saying, I'm one of the ones that were subject to the things written in this book. Worship God, he says. Worship God. He said, I'm of your brethren, the prophets. I'm part of you. I'm part of the same family that you're from. Part of your brethren, the prophets. This could easily have been Daniel. Daniel, having seen all these things that John is witnessing now and explaining it to his fellow brethren, what was going on. I, have, I could be wrong. I mean, there's no reason. The Bible don't give me any reason to suspect it's Daniel. I just think it is. I think this man who is showing this angel, who is showing these things to him, because he has announced himself as one of your brethren, of the prophets. It's, I just have, I have that suspicion. I, and I could be wrong. I've, I've been wrong. I, how many times have I said, my opinion and $2 will get you a cup of coffee anywhere. But that's just my opinion. That, that this person that he's speaking to, maybe on both occasions, it might be the same person, but it, but it could very possibly be Daniel. I want to read, and speaking of Daniel, I want to read a little bit from Daniel. Because this kind of explains what happens when this flesh, this mortal flesh that we're living in, when this flesh is in the presence of holiness, <clears throat> when this flesh is in the presence of righteousness, listen to what happens to it. Listen, listen to what, what happens. And Daniel chapter 10, verses 4 through 11 says this, And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, white linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body was like the barrel. His body also was like barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. That voice of many waters we heard a minute ago, and hear the voice of a multitude. I think I've explained this before, but I went to Niagara Falls one time, a long time ago. And when you go to Niagara Falls, I went to the Canadian side, and, and 
there, there's places you, I, I can't describe exactly how it was but anyway there are tunnels that you can walk through that take you up they, they somehow they come out very close to the water to the falling of the water and when you're walking in those tunnels I, I i didn't walk all the way to the end of them because it was taking my breath i could not breathe inside those tunnels because of the, the suction that was going on from the water falling but the roar of that water I mean, I had I had a grown man standing right next to me, and we were screaming at each other, and we could not hear what the other one was saying. And when I read in the Bible, when I when I read and, and somebody speaks and and it sounds as the voice of many waters, that's the noise that that that's what my mind that's where the place where my mind goes to, is when I was at Niagara Falls, and I was hearing and and all it was was water. That's the only noise I could hear was the noise of that water. But the, the noise of that water was so thunderous and so loud that I couldn't hear a grown man screaming in my ear, literally. When I, when I think of that, it's the voice of a multitude. I mean, just, just think about being in a crowd. Have you ever been in a place like Grand Central Station or someplace where there's a lot of people, a football stadium? I've never been to a football game, but I mean, I, I understand that when, when people here, when they go to see Alabama play, when they go to, to, to uh, the football stadium and watch Alabama play, it's, it's awful. The, the noise is awful. You can't hear it when you watch it on TV. But when you're there, it's incredible because there's, you know, 85 to Talladega. I've never been to Talladega, but I can imagine 125, 135,000 people all screaming at the same time. I can imagine what that sounds like because I've heard Niagara Falls. I've heard the voice of many waters. I've not really heard the voice of a lot of people outside of a, you know, a small stadium or, or whatever. But anyway, um, but his words were like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone, listen to what he's saying. I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me, they saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. They didn't even see what Daniel was seeing. But it's, it's in the presence of this, just in the proximity of this holiness and this righteousness, which is Christ in front of Daniel, they had to run away from it, even though they didn't see it. Daniel said they didn't see it. But the great quaking fell on them anyway. But I saw it. So Daniel experienced what they experienced along with the visionary aspect, aspect of it also. He saw it and felt that holy presence. <clears throat> Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision and there remained no strength in me. There remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption. That word corruption literally means death. My comeliness, my life force was turned in me into corruption and death. And I heard and I, re and I retained no strength, yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then, was in I, then I was in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. So what Daniel's saying is, I saw this and I felt that holiness. I felt that righteousness in the air that these other men felt and ran away from. And I died. But in my corrupt state, in my death, I heard the words that he spoke unto me. What did Jesus say? His words are life. His words are life and life eternal. He spoke life back into Daniel. And at that point, I was in a deep sleep on with my face, and my face was toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set, up, set me up on my knees and upon the palms of my hands. <clears throat> and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Here again, Daniel and John, the two people who saw the end of the world, the two people who saw the end of existence, the only two people on earth ever referred to in the Bible as beloved. 
Both of them were end times apocalyptic revelators. Both of them were. Daniel wrote his down. He wasn't allowed to publish it. John saw the same thing Daniel saw and he was allowed to publish. He was allowed to write it down and publish it as well because it had to be out there. It had to be part of the canon because he was the last living hand-picked apostle by Christ Jesus. That's why it had to come together at that time. So the only two men in the Bible that are ever referred to as beloved are also the only two who are also both of them saw the end times. That's why I have no problem whatsoever believing that this person that John fell down in front of and worshiped was actually Daniel. I have no problem believing that. Again, I could be wrong, but that's what I believe. O oh, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he spoke in this word unto me, I stood trembling. That's what happens to this flesh when it gets in the presence of holiness. That's why I think it's so cute and funny. I see these things on Facebook and these people talking about, oh, when I see Jesus, I'm just going to run up to him and I'm just going to wrap my arms around him and we're just going to dance the night away. I'm just going to be happy, happy, happy. And these other people say, I just like to crawl up in the lap of God and he's my big old papa and I just want to pull on his beard and I just want him to hug me tight because he's just all love. He's just all about love. See, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. He's righteous and he's holy and he's sovereign and this flesh, now of course, we're not going to meet him in this flesh. I, I hear the arguments in your mind. I can hear you screaming at the computer screen. I understand we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. I understand that. I understand the Bible says when we see him, we're going to be just like him. That's fixing to come into play. That's fixing to come into play. We're going to be just like him. I understand that. I get that. But in this flesh, we can't be in the presence of that holiness. So what does that mean? Think about this. We're fixing to get into the part here where Jesus and all of us come back. We're going to leave heaven in verse 11 and we're going to come back to the earth. And the battle is going to take place. So bear in mind what's happening to Daniel here. In his flesh, in his mortal flesh, he's beating Christ Jesus. The Bible says that when we see him, we're going to be just like him. He's going to destroy many with the brightness of his being. The armies of the earth, the armies of the Antichrist, the armies that we're going to come against when we come back, that Christ is going to come against, not us. They're going to be in this mortal flesh. They're not going to be able to stand in His presence. What does the Bible say? He's going to destroy them with the word of His mouth, the word, the sword of His mouth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians chapter 6 tells us. And He's going to destroy them with the brightness of His being. Every single member of the army of Antichrist on this earth that we encounter when we come back with Christ Jesus their flesh is going to react to his righteousness and holiness the exact same way Daniel reacted to this. Keep that in mind. Bear that in mind. So I am part of you, this angel said. I'm part of who you are. I'm one of your brethren of the prophets. Whether it's Daniel or not, don't really matter. But we know that John fell at the feet of this man twice. John also fell, remember in, in Revelation 1, when John met Jesus? Now remember, John, he traveled the earth, with, he traveled the world with Jesus for three and a half years. He walked with him all day. You know, he, he worked with him when they were feeding people. He helped. He gathered people up. He, you know, he did it. He, he ministered. He ministered to Jesus. He kept his need. They sat around the campfire together. The Bible says that he laid on Jesus' shoulder that he'd lay on him at night and, and whatever. You know, this wasn't the first time John met Jesus. But in Revelation chapter 1, when John met Jesus as he is, he fell down as a dead man. This is somebody he'd met before. This is somebody he'd spent a lot of time with. 
But when he saw him, when he turned, he says, I turned to look at who was speaking to me, and I fell down as a dead man. And the flesh, the mortal flesh of the enemies of God is going to react the same way in the presence of Christ and all of those. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why? Why are they blessed? One reason, just one, one of the reasons, one of the many, many reasons. But just one of them is that when we see Him, we shall be just like Him. And then it goes on to say, and we shall be known as I am known. I shall know as I am known. And every little minuscule atom of my being is known by Christ Jesus. The brightness of his being. And I felt his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, he has the testimony of Jesus. And then he says, Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy at its heart is designed to unfold the wisdom and the teachings and the beauty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In this present age, the spirit of God is not only to glorify Christ, but to show believers things which are to come as they relate to His person and His majesty. Let me say that again. In this present age, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God is not only there to glorify Christ, but to show us, to show believers, things that are to come as they relate to Christ and His person and His majesty. John chapter 16, verses 12 through 16 says this. I, this is Jesus talking. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. I have many things that I need to tell you, but you can't stand to hear it, Jesus says. You can't bear them now. For what reason? For many reasons. Time, experience. But the Bible says that though he were a son, yet he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Jesus went through a learning process. And we have to go through a learning process. Jesus is not saying, I've got many things to say unto you, but I can't because you're so stupid. That's not what he was saying. You can't bear them now. There's things that if I tried to explain them to you now, you wouldn't understand because you have not went through the situation that you need to go through so that you can fully get a grasp on this particular piece of information. Remember, I've said this before. Jesus, he, he gives out wisdom to us in increments. It's, it's on a need-to-know basis. It literally is on a need-to-know basis. And it's not because we're stupid. It's because we haven't lived this life experience that he knows we're going to live so that this particular verse will come alive in a particular kind of way. There's no such thing as 10 men sitting in a room and 10 men having 10 different interpretations of the same scripture. That's a lie from the devil. If you think that, if you've heard that before, that's a lie from the devil. What there is, though, is I can read Psalm 23 today and it will mean something to me today based on a situation and experience or based on a, a tribulation or trial that I'm going through right now. But tomorrow I can read Psalm 23 based on a different experience, a different trial, a different tribulation, a different thing going on in my life. And Psalm 23 meaning an entirely different thing to me because it witnesses to a different aspect of a different situation. 
It's not because there's more than one interpretation of that scripture. It's because that scripture is going to validate some kind of life experience or some kind of thing that you're going through at that particular time. So that's what Jesus is saying. I got a lot of stuff I need to say to you, but right now you can't bear them out because you've not lived. I mean, remember, they'd been up to this point. They'd just been following him around. He'd been doing everything. He's been doing all the work. He's been doing all the planning. He's been doing all the travel. He's been doing all the ones that said, let's go here, let's go there. They hadn't even had to think. All they're doing is just following around and helping him, helping him out with actual physical labor and learning. <clears throat> He's done everything so far. He's done everything. He even got money out of the mouth of a fish so they could pay their taxes. He's done every single thing for them. And he says, there's a whole lot of stuff that you need to know, but you haven't lived through the things that you need to live through so that what I have to say to you will make sense or it will manifest wisdom in you so that you can help others. That's what he's saying. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it, or although, or but... When He, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost, when He, the Spirit of Truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. He's the one that's going to lead you. He's the one that's going to guide you. He's the one that six years from now, He's going to reveal this truth to you that I can't speak to you now because it won't make any sense to you right now. But when this thing that I know is in your future happens in six years from today, then He at that time is going to speak that truth into your life and it's going to mean something. And you're going to be able to take that situation and you're going to be able to take that brand new bit of wisdom and knowledge that He's going to lay on you and you're going to be able to use that to help somebody else. That's what He's saying. He, the Holy Ghost, when He comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself. That is a very very important statement right there. He shall not speak of himself. Now hold on a minute. We serve a trinity. We serve a father and a son and a Holy Ghost. And all these three are one. Jesus is God. God is Jesus. Jesus is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is Jesus. The Holy Ghost is God. There are three separate beings, but they all are one. See, it don't matter how it don't matter how intelligent we are, no matter how much we like to think we've got a grasp on the Trinity, we don't. We don't have a grasp on the Trinity. For for different reasons. See, in one place, Jesus says, You can any sin that you commit against God the Father. And any sin that you can get that you can commit against me, anything you can dream up to blaspheme, to discredit, to disavow, to disannul our example, whatever you want, anything that you can dream up, any sin you can come against against the Father, God the Father, and against me, all of those will be forgiven. But if you commit one single sin against the Holy Ghost, it will not be forgiven, not in this life or in the life to come. So in that one place, he, he said that he elevated the office of the Holy Ghost to a point that literally is above he and the Father. He elevated him to that position. You can sin against the Father, you can sin against me, and it will all be forgiven. But if you ever sin against the Holy Ghost, it will never be forgiven. We refer to it as the unpardonable sin. Mean much, much theological discourse about what exactly the unpardonable sin is. Basically, it's the rejection of the Word of God. It's the absolute rejection of the Bible, the Word of God. That is the unpardonable sin. That's the reason you'll go to hell. You can be forgiven for adultery. You can be forgiven for murder. You can be forgiven for anything you can come up with, anything you want to dream up with. But if you reject the Word of God, because who presents the Word of God to you? It's reading a book. This is a book. This is words on a page. 
the words on this page are not what gives this book life. That's why it's not condemning to, to mark this book. Because it is, after all, a book. It is paper and ink. This is a book. The Holy Ghost that is the book is what gives it the life and brings it alive. The author, the one who wrote it, the Holy Ghost prompted, the Bible says the scriptures were prompted, men were prompted to write these words down based on what they heard from the Holy Ghost. He gives it life. He gives it eternal life. He gives it the power. He gives it the essence. So in that one place, Jesus elevated him above all things on his own. You can be forgiven for any sin you commit against the Father and Son, but one single sin against the Holy Ghost, because there's only one, and that's the rejection of the Word, the, the whole Trinity. You reject Him. But here, right here, He says, He shall not speak of Himself. What does that mean? <clears throat> Listen, I grew up in Pentecostal church. I grew up in Pentecostal belief. I grew up where you have from, from the time you're born, when you're in diapers, you are instructed that you are not to quench the Holy Ghost, you are to fear the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is all above all things. The Holy Ghost is worshiped. We are not supposed to worship the Holy Ghost. We are not supposed to sing songs to the Holy Ghost. He is not to be worshiped. Now I know that sounds weird. I know that sounds funny. And if you've been, if you have any experience, if you're watching this video and you have any experience whatsoever with the Pentecostal church, you're sitting there going, oh, I just committed an unpardonable sin. I gotta turn this off real quick because I can't. You can't do this no more. He just, he just, I can't believe he said that out loud. But that's the truth. <coughs> Jesus said, he will not speak of himself. He will not prompt men to write songs about him. If you've been prompted by the Holy Ghost to write a song, praise and worship in the Holy Ghost. If you've ever raised your hands in a church and said, praise and worship to the Holy Ghost. You're in the wrong. <clears throat> Rightly divide the Word of God. He will not speak of Himself. And why am I pushing all this? Because we just got through reading. He says, Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Of prophecy. So Jesus is saying, The Holy Ghost, when He comes, the Comforter, He will not speak of Himself. But whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. Who's He going to hear it from? From God the Father. And He will show you things to come. There is prophecy. That is the very heart of prophecy right there. I'm going away. But when I go away, I'm not going to leave you all by yourself. I'm going to send you a comforter. And he is going to teach you all things. What's he going to teach you specifically? He will show you things to come. And what else? All things that the Father hath are mine, Jesus says. Therefore said I that he, the Holy Ghost, shall take of mine and show it to you a little while and you shall not see me and again a little while and you shall see me because I go to the Father we have a comforter we have an instructor we have a teacher we have the third part of the Godhead who has been elevated in one way above the other two but in another way, Jesus has made it plain and clear that he's not going to speak of anything except me. Jesus says that. Christ is not only the major theme of the scriptures, but also the central theme of prophecy. Again, in the book of John, this time in chapter 5, listen to what verse 37 and 39 through 39 says. And the Father himself, which has sent me, this is Jesus talking, the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Talking about God the Father. 
This is Jesus saying, the one who sent me has borne witness of me. And you, you've never heard his voice or seen what he looks like. That's what he's saying to them. And yet, and you have not his word abiding in you. For whom hath sent him, you believe not. Search the scriptures. Listen to what he's saying. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Listen to that. That's very, those are very sobering words right there. Listen to what he's saying carefully. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. The scriptures that you're supposed to search where you think you have eternal life, those same scriptures are the ones that speak of me. Now obviously this is Jesus talking. So obviously the New Testament wasn't written yet. So what scriptures is he talking about? What scriptures could he possibly be talking about? He said, search the scriptures. He didn't say, listen to me. He said, God sent me, and you ain't heard his voice at any time, but you've rejected me. You don't believe what I say. But search the scriptures. And when you search the scriptures where you think you have eternal life, you're going to find out that those scriptures are talking about me, he's saying. What scriptures is he talking about? The Torah, the Pentateuch, the prophets and the Psalms and the Proverbs. He's talking about the Old Testament. The, 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 the actual scriptures, the actual book that was being carried around in that day is what's known as the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the, 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 the language of the day was Greek. So in order for everybody that spoke, just about everybody that spoke Greek, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, had to be translated into, from Hebrew to Greek. And that is known as the Septuagint. The Septuagint was published 300 years before Christ came along. So the book, the actual book that people carried around, I mean, they didn't carry around books like this, codexes, but the actual scriptures that he's talking about is the Septuagint because that's what was read in Jesus' day. And it was uh, the Greek, the, 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 the word translated from Hebrew to Greek because the language of the day was Greek. Now we can get a Septuagint, and I wish I had one. I wish I, I wish I, I mean, you can get a Septuagint, but what I would like to have don't exist. And what I would like to have is a, a Bible that has, for the Old Testament, it has the Septuagint with the King James New Testament in one book and as a carrying Bible. Because the Septuagint we have now, what it is, is the Septuagint was translated from Hebrew to Greek, and then the Greek was translated to English, to the King's English. That's, that's the Old Testament that I would like to have because there is so much more, so much deeper, so much more things available through the Septuagint that are not, that are not in the King James. And I'm not saying, the King, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm a King James person. I don't read nothing but the King James. But if I had a Bible, if I could buy a Bible that had a Septuagint, a, a LXX is what it's known as, 70, that word 7, 70, because it was 70 translators, the, the, the LXX, Old Testament, and a King James New Testament, I'd be a happy camper. I would be a happy camper. And I'm not talking about a Catholic Bible with all the, with all the lost books in, in it either. That's just that's too much to carry around. <clears throat> so Christ is not only the major theme of Scripture, but He is the central theme of prophecy. That's what that means. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I don't know how long I've been at this, but that's where we're going to stop. It's about where we stopped at last night, and uh, that's where I'm going to stop this morning because now we're fixing to break off into the first ten verses. Like I said, we're all praise and worship for the destruction of Babylon and a little bit of uh, <coughs> explanation <coughs> there at the end. But starting in uh, verse 11, we're all coming back. So we'll wait till uh, we'll stop there. And if this ends up being a short video, then... 
praise God for it and happy be ye uh, for it. But uh, before I go, I want you to turn with me for just a minute to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to read just a few scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And Timothy, the books of 1 and 2 Timothy, of course, are Paul writing to Timothy, who was an apostle of Paul, or a, a follower of Paul. Paul found him when he was a young man, remember the, the study of Acts? <coughs> and Paul knew Timothy's mother and grandmother very well. He was very well acquainted with his family. And he took Timothy with him and took him on the trail, so to speak. Trained him up. He took him, he, he circumcised him, and he, and he trained him, and he followed him around, and Timothy went on to become, you know, a great man of God through the teaching and the, and the leadership and the guidance of Paul. And the letters, First and Second Timothy, of course, are letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, who was to become a pastor to begin with, but Timothy also would go on, remember at the beginning of the Revelation study, we talked about this, at the time when John was 96 years old, or about 96 AD is about when the book of Revelation was actually written down by John, and John was, you know, in his 90s, he was somewhere in his, in his 90s, right before he died, he was in prison on Patmos, and he had these letters, he was writing these letters, and he got them delivered, and he had these, when he sent the seven letters that make up chapters one and two of Revelation, when he actually handed those letters, what he had written down on, when he said here, when he had got through writing parts of the book of Revelation, he was in a jail cell, and he handed this piece of paper to somebody that was not in this jail cell, and he said, this needs to be delivered to these seven churches which are in Asia. Well, see, when, when, what, he, what he probably actually said was, he stuck that the piece of paper through the bars of the jail and he says, take this to Timothy. Because at that time, Timothy was the head of and the, the bishop over all of these seven churches. He was the bishop that, pre pre that presided over the community that was these seven churches. These seven churches weren't spread out that far apart. Remember, they were all within a 20, within 20, every single one of them was within, I think, 25 miles of each other. But Timothy, at that time, was the bishop who was in charge of all these churches. So he had risen up from, you know, this little boy that Paul picked up on, on the trail and had raised him up in the gospel and taught him and trained him and prepared him and set him off on what would end up being a great life's work in the service of the kingdom of Christ. Because John would have handed these letters out of his prison cell and he would have said, take this to Timothy for the seven churches. That's how that would have started. So Paul is writing these letters to Timothy at a time before that when Timothy was being prepared. Paul had prepared him all of his life. He would spent all the time they had together preparing Timothy to be a leader because that's what Paul did with everybody. I mean, Paul rolled into a town and he preached the gospel. And then the Bible says once he preached the gospel and he got up a group of saved men, then he started setting up elders he started looking at these men and listening to the, to the leading and the guidance of the Holy Ghost and became told, I mean, I'm sure when Paul got Timothy away from his mama, it wasn't just cause, I mean, it wasn't just, you know, just a, a spur of the minute, hey, you want to go for a little, you want to go for a little ride or you want to go for, a, you know, on a great adventure? It wasn't that kind of deal. No doubt in my mind whatsoever, the Holy Ghost not only told Paul, but told Timothy's mother, said he's to go with this man and be trained up in the gospel. I've called him to be a servant of mine. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that's the way it happened. This stuff ain't happenstance. Remember, there is no, there is no Hebrew word for coincidence. Coincidence does not exist in God's world. He knows everything beforehand, afterhand, and everything in between. So there is no coincidence. Now, the, I'm rattling on. I I'm, I'm, can't believe what a talker I've turned into. 
But when we read these scriptures, bear in mind that Paul, our apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles, is writing these words to a man who, if not already is, is quickly fixing to become the pastor of a church, the leader of a flock. He's about to or already is a man in charge of other people's eternal souls. He's writing to Timothy about the church. He's not writing, there's, there's, a, there's a list, we're going to read a list here. And there's a list that's almost exactly like this in the chapter 1 of the book of Romans. That list is written to the world at large. That list, that list is written to sinners at large. And it's almost an identical list to this one here, but the difference is Paul's writing down these words to a man who's a pastor, who's a shepherd of a flock, who's in charge of people's souls, and he's saying, this is what's going to happen in your church. I'm not talking to you about sinners, Timothy. I'm talking to you about people that are going to sit under your authority that you are going to be responsible for. Listen to what he says. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Have you ever in your life seen a time or ever heard about a time in history when men, when people were so wrapped up in me, 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 men will be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, openly covetous. I want this. I want that. We've got an entire industry that, ba that is based entirely on the ability to create covetousness in other people. What's that industry called? Madison Avenue. Every ad, every TV commercial, every magazine ad, every radio ad you've ever heard in your life, every single one of those ads are designed to put you in a position to covet something. We fall prey to it 11 million times every day, whether it's watching the news, reading a magazine, listening to the radio, watching TV. We openly and willingly put ourselves into a position where other people can create covetousness in us, even on Facebook. Look at what I got. I want one. Look at what I can do. I want one. Look at Pinterest. Pinterest is cut. The, the, whole, the whole idea of Pinterest is here's this person over here that can do this. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to take a picture of it and I'm going to show everybody what I can do so that everybody's going to want to do what I do. That's covetousness. Anytime you want something that belongs to somebody else, whether they want you to want it or not, that's beside the point. It matters not that the whole, the whole purpose of that TV commercial is to make you covetous toward that thing. The, the problem is you're falling prey to it. We are falling prey to it. This is the last days, the end days, perilous times. Men are going to love themselves and they're going to be covetous. They're going to be boasters. Look at what I can do. Look at me. Look at my selfie. I've got more pictures of me on my Facebook page than any of my other friends. I've got more friends on my friends list than anybody I know. I'm the most popular person in my school, in my workplace, in my whatever. Boasters. Covetous. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. If you read the Word of God, if you study the Word of God, one of the first things you're going to realize is there is a lot more things that are considered blasphemy than just taking the Lord thy God's name in vain. We call that blaspheming. But I promise you, there are, there are a million other options in the Bible related to us by the Holy Ghost. That, that, that are blasphemous. Everyday common activities that we all participate in are blasphemous and we don't even know it. Because we've relegated that word blasphemy to one individual very distinct act. 
Now, I'm not saying we should take the Lord's name in vain. When we, when, when, that's not what I'm saying. We should adhere to that. But we should also understand the full counsel of God. And we should take a look in the rest of the book and see where else we might be blaspheming and don't know it. It's well worth a look. It's well worth consideration. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful and unholy. That, that right there... See, when we read this list in Romans chapter 1, at the end of this list, there's a very distinct scripture that says, we know that the people who commit these things, talking about this list, it's almost identical to this one here. We know that these people cannot inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? What, what is Paul saying by that? We know that those people who commit these things are going to go to hell. They are not worthy to be admitted into the kingdom of God. These people cannot make it into the kingdom of God. And one of the things that's on both of those lists is being disobedient to parents. Listen to that, people. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. One of the things that's wrong with the world today is that we have no fear of God anymore. We do not fear God. And I don't mean, I don't mean respect Him. I mean we don't fear Him. When you read in the Bible, that, and the Bible says that you can go to hell for disrespecting your parents, that should make your bones rattle, people. That should make you tremble. You can go to hell for disrespecting your parents. Why don't that turn us inside out? Why do we not see the gravity in these words, if we're a child of God and we say that we believe what the Bible says, then when the Bible says that you can go to hell because you disrespected your parents, we should believe that. We should also believe when the Bible tells us that we can go to hell for not making our children respect us. That should rattle our bones. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. God is a righteous and a holy and a sovereign God. He's not a papaw that you can crawl up in his lap and make fun of him. He's not a big giant Santa Claus in the sky. He's not an ATM machine. He's not sitting up there on the edge of his seat waiting for you to ask for something so he can drop it into your life. He is a sovereign, righteous, holy, eternal being. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful and unholy. What makes you holy? The washing of water by the Word. That's the only thing that can make you holy. Verse 3, without natural affection. There's your homosexual aspect. Without natural affection. Homosexual affection is not natural affection. Men being affectionate with men and women being affectionate with women is not natural affection. Without natural affection. Truce breakers. A man's word don't mean anything anymore. Nothing. Nobody makes a deal with a handshake anymore because every man is individually corrupt. False accusers. Liars. That's, that's, basic, that's basically a liar. Your false accuser. You're accusing people of things that they did not do. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's to make yourself look better or to get out of some jam that you're in. How quick and how willing are we to falsely accuse somebody else to save our own butts? False accusers. Incontinent. What does that mean? 
No self-control. What do you mean by no self-control? I mean just that. You've got no self-control. I just can't keep. I, just, I know it's wrong, but I just can't. I just I have to do this one little thing. I just I just can't keep myself from doing this. It's just my it's my guilty little vice. It's my you know it's my guilty little pleasure. Nobody really and it don't do nobody no harm. And you know whatever. Fill in the blank. Go to the casino, buy a lottery ticket, whatever it is. Whatever 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 that is. It don't matter what it is. It don't matter how big or how small it is. We're not talking about big sin, small sin. We're talking about things that we should not do, things that we know are wrong. The Bible says if you know to do something right and you do it not, that is a sin. We have, it is time for the church of God, for the body of Christ, to start taking the words of the Bible, literally taking them into consideration in our everyday normal life. I've said this before and I'll say this again. I am sick to hear. I am sick to hear with these grace bubble people. It's all about grace. God loves and God loves everybody. It's all about grace. I can do whatever I want to because it's grace. Let me tell you something, people. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, brethren. Let me explain something to you. Whether you like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, Jesus, God, did not take on the form of man and come to this earth to be beat and mocked and made fun of and to be whipped and bled out like a cow, like a stuck animal, and hung on a cross and die a humiliating death so that you can put on a bikini and go to the beach and have a cold beer. I don't care what you think. That's not grace. That is a putrefication of the liberty that God has granted you that you have taken to an access that don't exist. My God did not bleed and die a public humiliating death so that you can have a kegger on the weekend and not live under guilt because there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ. What does that mean? There's plenty of condemnation to those that are not in Christ. And I promise you, if you're in Christ, if the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, that same spirit is not going to tell you it's okay for you to have a big blowout kegger at your house on the weekends. Jesus didn't die so that you could drink and you could smoke weed and you could do all these other things that we do in the name of grace. You're not serving Christ Jesus. You're serving yourself. You're serving your flesh. You are living a sensual, a sense-filled, false Christianity. The Spirit of God does not exist so that it's to tell you that it's okay to do whatever your pet sin is. If you had to ever, if the, if the thought ever enters into your mind that you need to justify any kind of anything that you're doing, chances are you better stay away from that thing. Jesus did not die so that we could sin. We don't live in a bubble of grace. Grace is an unmerited, unearned gift of God that we take advantage of. Remember, Paul is writing this list of these things to a man who's a pastor of a flock. Paul is describing Timothy's congregation and he's describing your congregation. And he's describing my congregation. He's describing the people that we're going to church with right now. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, no self-control, fierce. Fierce. Fierceness is coming into play. We got a man running for president that, 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 that 
99% of his appeal is his fierceness. I like Donald Trump because he says it like it is. He tells it like it is. He don't hold back. He speaks his mind. He says out loud what I'm thinking in my mind. That's fierceness. We're serving that. We're worshiping that. We're openly jumping on the Donald Trump train because of fierceness. A word that's on a list that describes people who cannot make it to heaven. Despisers of those that are good. We can't stand good people. We can't stand Bible thumpers. We can't stand these Bible Belt people that don't want to do it. We can't stand these modern day Sadducees and Pharisees. I get called a Pharisee all the time because I believe in going to church, because I believe in speaking what the Bible says. I'm a wretched, nasty, disgusting, filthy sinner. I promise you, I promise you, if you could glimpse in here for 30 seconds, if you could just take a look inside my mind for 30 seconds, you would, you would banish me from your entire life. I would never be allowed inside of a church building again ever. I am a filthy, disgusting sinner. But that does not mean that I am not obligated to tell you every single holy, righteous word that's written in the Bible. And the same goes for everybody else because we're all in that nasty, filthy rag category. But that does not let any of us back away from the fact that the Bible is righteous, the Bible is sinless, the Bible is holy, the Bible is omnipotent, the Bible is truth, and the Bible is faithfulness. And we are obligated to preach every single word of it. It don't matter how filthy and disgusting you are because we're all filthy and disgusting. But we are haters of that which is good. We don't want to teach what the Bible actually says, mainly because of the conviction of the things that are in our own hearts. The unholiness and the unrighteousness that dwells within me. That's not what compels me to teach what the Bible says. The holiness and the righteousness that's in the Bible that is the spirit of prophecy, that is the testimony of Jesus Christ, the gospel that has to be preached, and he chose filthy, nasty, disgusting people to preach it. People like me and people like you. But we hate that which is good. Remember, we're talking about the congregations in our churches. Haters of good. Verse 4, traitors, backstabbers. Tell you one thing, go do another one. How many times have you ever done that? How many times have you ever said, I'll be praying for you and walked away from it and crawled in a bottle somewhere and forgot all about it? That makes you a traitor. That makes me a traitor. Every time I've ever looked into, into the eyes of somebody that's hurting and said, I'll do so-and-so, and walked away from that situation and did not do what I said I would do, that makes me a traitor. You don't have to be Benedict Arnold. You don't have to betray the, 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 the soundness of your country to be a traitor. You can be a traitor to your brother and your sister. When you're not there for them, when you tell them you'll be there for them, when you let them down because of guilty pleasure, because of whatever, that makes me and you a traitor. Traitors. Heady, full of ourselves. High-minded, full of ourselves. And listen to this one. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That don't say people that don't love God. Paul's not talking about people that don't. He's not talking about people that have rejected the gospel. He's talking about people that love God. Remember, he's talking to Timothy about his congregation, about the members of his church. He's talking to us about the members of our church. 
The books of Timothy and Titus are supposed to be read as a pastor, as a servant, as a deacon, as an elder, whatever. Those are, those are considered the instructions for the elder, for the leadership in the Bible. So he's talking to me and you about our church, our congregations, our flocks. If you've got a family, you're a, you're a head of a flock. If you've got kids, you've got a flock. Whether you're male or female. If you've got people who listen to you, if you've got people who depend on you, if you've got people that you lead in any kind of way, you have a flock. You are a shepherd. And you are responsible for the entire counsel of God, including these two lists in Romans chapter 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. You are responsible to spot these things in people and to do something about it. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Now the reason I went into this, here's what I want everybody to think about for a while. For to, I don't put a time limit on it. Think about it. what exactly is a pleasure? Maybe get into that. Maybe open your Bible up. Maybe open up your concordance. Maybe get online. There's all kinds of stuff online. Bible commentaries, Bible hubs, Bible what anything, anywhere you want to go. Do a little research into that word that's translated here as pleasures. You might be surprised what all kind of activities falls into the category that Paul generalizes there as pleasures. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Again, if the Spirit of God, the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and I promise you, I promise you, you can argue with me till the day you die. You can call me a Pharisee all you want to. But I promise you, if that Spirit lives within you, the Spirit of God is not ever going to give you permission to go to the lake instead of going to church on Sunday and fellowshipping with your Christian brothers and sisters. Never. The Spirit of God is never going to counsel you that it's okay for you to not assemble with your fellow brothers and sisters. Ever. That's a promise. If you hadn't grasped in all this revelation, in all the things that we've read about what John saw in heaven, if you haven't grasped what it is that made John fall down on his hands and knees and worship what he knew was not Christ Jesus, if you've not grasped the holiness and the sovereignty and the righteousness of what God is by now. Don't stop trying. Ask God for help with it. If it's not plain right here, if it's not very clear right here, exactly why John fell down and worshipped this non-deity, then you need to ask God for help. These are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And look at what he says. From such turn away. Remember, Paul's talking to a pastor. He don't mean if when you encounter these people, turn away from them and go away from them. That's not what he means. He means turn them away. If you have people in your congregation that are doing these things, turn them away. If you have members of your church that fall into any of these categories, get rid of them. Turn them away. From such, turn away. 
Why on earth would the Bible instruct us to not have anything to do with sinners and not try and teach them and show them the way? Remember, these are members of his congregation. You let everybody in. You let everybody listen. But always remember that, the, that, that nobody comes to Christ Jesus and don't change. If people come in in a certain situation and they spend six months coming to your church and in six months they're still living in those certain situations, it's time to get them out of your church because they're going to start living in the lump. The leaven is going to start spreading into the lump. They're affecting your church. They're not being affected by the gospel. They're affecting your flock. Just because you've been taught something all your life don't mean that it's absolute gospel truth. The point and the purpose of studying the Bible one-on-one -on -one with a personal relationship with Christ Jesus is just that, so that He can instruct you in the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's what the Comforter does. Now why would Paul instruct Timothy to turn these people away? Turn away from them. Well, well, we've already talked about Romans chapter 1. I'm almost done, I promise. Let me tell you why Paul says it's a good idea to keep these people away from you. Romans chapter 1, remember the same list. I'm not going to read through the same list. Let's go straight to the end of it. Start in verse 29. Paul's listing all these people. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, and whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. There that is in the middle of the list of all these vile, putrid activities and sins. There's that thing that says, disobedient to parents. <laughs> Verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, there's the homosexuals again, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, listen to this, they know the judgment of God, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. He's not talking about the death of the body. He's talking about they are worthy to be cast into hell. All of these people, he's saying, Knowing the judgment of God beforehand, because how did he start out in Romans chapter 1? These people, they knew God, but they did not worship Him as God. Therefore, they got turned over to a reprobate mind. They knew God. They recognized God for who He was, but they refused to worship Him. And they chose instead to worship the creature more than the Creator. And they turned the image of God into birds and fowls and creeping things. They're idolizing the creation. These people who knew the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Listen to this. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So you don't even have to commit any of these things to be worthy of death, you just have to justify the activities of other people who are doing them. And, and like I said in my post on Facebook, we love to point to homosexuals in these scriptures, but we ignore everything else. We ignore everything. And there's a whole list of things there that are going on in your church right now, and they're going on in my church right now. So why did Paul tell Timothy to get these people out of there? Because you're eventually going to turn in to someone who takes pleasure 
in somebody doing these things. Your congregation is going to turn into a bunch of people who justify the actions of these people who are worthy of death, thereby making themselves worthy of death also. That's why you turn them away. You don't allow the leaven to infect the whole lump. You get rid of the leaven before it infects the lump. Everybody's welcome to come in and hear the Word of God, but if you're not allowing the Word of God to change you, if you're, not, if you're resisting the Word of God, if you've got people who are resisting the Word of God, and they're trying to change the Word of God instead of change their behavior, we need to get rid of them. Why? Because this, we're living in a time, this is the end, people. This is the end. The time for play is over. God ain't winking his eyes at things anymore. The time for play is over. When I was a child, I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. It's time to put away childish things. It's time to dig into the Word. It's time to, to, to quit denying the Word where it involves our pet sins and accept the whole counsel of the Word of God. And don't let naysayers convince you that you have no business preaching the Word of God because you're a child, you're a, a human being. We're all human beings. We're all filthy and nasty. We're all disgusting sinners. But that does not take away the obligation from any of us to preach the holiness and the sovereignty and the righteousness of a holy God and the one that we serve. The God of the Old Testament didn't retire. He didn't quit. He didn't go away. He's not asleep. He didn't back off from what he's declared. We still serve the same God that Abraham served. We still serve the same God that Lot served. We still serve the same God that told Noah to build a boat. We still serve the same God that came and found Cain when Cain's blood, his innocent blood, cried out to him from the ground. And like I've said before, the United States of America, the ground, the dirt, the land is squishy. It is squishy with the blood of innocence that we have taken the life from. Our land is squishy with innocent blood. If one man's blood could cry out to God, then believe you me, the blood of 65 million aborted United States citizens cry out to God every single minute. And what does God tell them? What does it say in Revelation? Wait just a little while until all those that have to be killed just like you are, are killed. And then will be the time. And they were given white robes and told to wait. He's talking about the congregation, the church, the body of Christ. It's time for the body of Christ to wake up. It's time for the body of Christ to quit gnawing and chewing itself to death. It's time for the whole body of Christ to get in line with the whole counsel of God and quit denying and quit justifying our pet sins and our pet grievances and our pet things that we want. Because believe me, you pick either list you want to, whether it's Romans chapter 1 or whether it's 2 Timothy chapter 3, I promise you, we're all in all of those things. We're all in all of those things. And the only reason we can overcome them is with the blood of Christ because we allow the blood of Christ to change our lives. But if we're not careful, we will allow the sin of the world to cause us to justify what's going on. Hashtag love wins. No, that's not the hashtag the church needs to take up. This is not my idea. But the hashtag the church needs to take up is hashtag love warns. Love don't win, love warns. So if you use hashtags, if you, want to, if you own Twitter, take it up. I got that from somebody. I got that from Repentance, uh, Repentance Cry Ministries, I believe is where I saw that. 
Hashtag love don't win, hashtag love warns. It don't matter that we're sinners, we're all sinners. That is not a reason to let the public at large stop you from preaching and teaching the unwatered down Word of God. That's the only thing that's going to change men's hearts. That's all. And 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 if you're if you're honest with yourself, everybody knows their own situation. I mean, I know my own situation, and you know nothing else could it could have been any other way. I didn't start serving Christ because of some person. I didn't get saved because of some man convinced me through uh, fancy words. I served. I started serving Christ because of the conviction that the Holy Ghost placed on my heart that no man alive could ever have done so. And if we stop putting this out there in its unadulterated version, nobody conviction is going to cease to exist. That's what's happened. That's what's ha that's what we're seeing in the churches today. That's what we see. Conviction is gone. That's not offense, my friends. That's the conviction of a holy God. And we cannot stop that. Otherwise, men stop coming to salvation, to the knowing salvation of Christ. I've rattled on enough. Um, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, next week we'll continue on in the book of Revelation. I hope... Uh, I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're learning. I hope God is blessing you. I know I go through the same thing every week, but it means the same thing to me every week. He blesses me with it every single week. Um, chapter 19, we only got three more chapters to go. I uh, don't have any idea how long it's going to take to get through them because these are the most exciting books in the book of Revelation as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I'm not discounting the book of Revelation. It's just that, you know, the, the, the church, the letters to the churches apply to us. And everything that happens after the seven-year tribulation period is over with applies to us. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm saying is exciting. Everything from this point forward, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, is where we all come back with Jesus back to come and take control of what is His. He's going to take control of the earth and things are going to start happening. And we are involved in all these things from this point forward. We're past the part where the church is watching from the balcony. Somebody on my Facebook page says that all the time. I, I love it. We're, we're, we're past the looking down from the balcony part and we're about to jump off the balcony and come back and be a part, a central part of the play. So that's what I mean by that. This is the part that's affecting the church. So God bless you for watching these videos. God bless you if you, if you suffer through to the end of these things. Um, I, I ask God to bless you special because the Lord knows I rattle on. But uh, I appreciate everybody that watches. I appreciate your comments. I appreciate you sharing them. So until next time, God bless you greatly.